In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, how do I make sure my emergency lighting is compliant? Just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of emergency lighting in association with Robus. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD, and you'll receive a certificate to prove you've completed the course. In the previous video in this series, we looked at certain terms used in connection with emergency lighting and saw that escape route lighting, as needed in an emergency evacuation of a building, also included a subsection on safety signs. So what does this include, and why does getting it right matter? Well, in an emergency, if a building needs to be evacuated, even people who use a building regularly can experience confusion in the heat and panic of having to flee from a building to safety. It can be even worse for people who may not have intimate knowledge of the property. For this reason, there are very specific rules for how much light needs to be on the escape route so people can find their way out safely. But interestingly, rather than diving straight into escape route illumination, the Electrician's Guide to Emergency Lighting suggests a different approach to emergency lighting design. If we turn to subheading 4.1.6 in that document, we find that we should stick to the following procedure. A. Carry out a risk assessment to identify the hazards that will require emergency lighting, including high-risk task areas. B. Refer to the evacuation strategy prepared for the fire detection and alarm system. More on risk assessments, etc. in a future video in this series. But just on a personal note, do make sure you understand the evacuation strategy properly. I once made a mistake in an emergency lighting design that led to more emergency exit luminaires than were necessary being installed. Fortunately, it didn't make the escape plan any more dangerous or confusing, but it was a bit more expensive than was necessary, and the people occupying the building ended up with more exit opportunities than a driver on the M25. The next steps are the ones that we're going to focus on in this video. C. Position signs and luminaires at primary escape locations with direction signs if necessary. See section 4.2. D. Position luminaires to illuminate all points of emphasis and at additional locations. E. Add luminaires as necessary to illuminate the escape routes. F. Add luminaires as necessary to illuminate the open areas. G. Illuminate high-risk task areas. And H. Position safety signs. Okay, so some points of note there. First of all, signs are given pretty heavy prominence, particularly at escape locations, even being listed ahead of luminaires in indent C there. Also, direction signs are critically important. More on that in a moment. So what does this mean for the electrician? Well, while you won't necessarily install signs that aren't a luminaire, some of the signage will be incorporated into your emergency fittings and signs that aren't luminaires still require a certain level of illumination on them. So the guide then goes on to identify locations that escape lighting luminaires will be required in under subheading 4.2.2. These positions include at each exit door intended to be used in an emergency. Interesting to note in the illustration there that the arrow is pointing up. We're circling that all important issue of which way should our signs point. Near stairs so that each flight of stairs receives direct light. This is important both so that people go the right way, but also for the same reason as the next location, which is near any other change in level. Obviously, wherever there's a step or a change in level, there's a chance someone could stumble if it's not illuminated well enough. Next up is mandatory emergency exits and safety signs. The example given in the picture is of a direction of travel sign, but could include signs to safety equipment like first aid locations or firefighting equipment. These probably wouldn't have their own internal illumination, so might require an emergency light fitting nearby. Of course, nowadays we do have the option for glowing the dark safety signs, but that's outside the scope of this video because, quite frankly, we're electricians. Of course we're going to prefer a nice light fitting instead. It's interesting we keep reading that word near in these examples. The note at the top of this page indicates that for the purposes of this clause, near means two meters. Over the page, we find some more examples of where we'd need escape lighting luminaires, including at each change of direction and intersection of corridors to stop people running into walls and other people. And don't forget the places without illustrations. This next one is really important and sometimes gets overlooked in an emergency lighting design near each final exit and outside the building to a place of safety. So it's not enough just to get people to the great outdoors, we need to get them to the assembly point. This is emphasised for us in the introduction to this chapter. We read this reminder about people who've left the building. Emergency illumination and escape signage will then be required on escape routes outside the building to guide and illuminate the way to a nominated assembly area place of safety where persons are checked to ensure that all are accounted for. Before you start worrying about providing some kind of emergency lighting along a path to the assembly point, the guide makes this point. 
it may well be that local street lighting can provide some or all of this external illumination, but these provisions should be regularly reassessed to confirm whether the street lights will still be illuminated at all times the premises is in use. If they will not, alternative emergency illumination arrangements should be made. So we don't want to over-engineer solutions, but we do want to keep people safe. Also, just an important note that the assembly point must not be an internal courtyard within the building. Outside means a place where they can get away from the building, not watch it burn down around their ears. Next is again a critical point that other items should have escaped lighting luminaires near them. This gets us started on indent D of the design process. These include first aid stations, firefighting equipment such as extinguishers and call points. A little later in the guide when discussing lighting levels it makes the point that these items should have a vertical illuminance of at least five lux. Often when carrying out lighting design we get a bit obsessed with the horizontal illuminance on or near the floor or a work surface but forget about the light levels in the vertical plane on walls, monitors and in this case signs and emergency equipment. There's also a couple more examples without illustrations, namely near escape equipment provided for the disabled and near disabled person refuges and disabled person toilet alarm positions. So this might include stretchers for manually carrying people downstairs if they're in a wheelchair. Of course, in an emergency, you're not supposed to use lifts in case you get stuck in one, so these are the alternative. You'll often find them in refuge areas. These are usually at landings of stairwells that are designed to severely minimise the chances of a fire breaking out in them, and also to slow down the spread of fire from adjoining spaces, maybe with the use of two sets of fire-resistant doors. There may also be a special intercom system in place that communicates with a central location so that those responsible for evacuating the building can monitor and control their situation. As well as this, there's also the toilet alarms that are required in accessible toilets should someone require help from within the loo. All these items require emergency lighting near them. Notice in indent D that it also mentions additional locations where emergency lighting is required. These are covered in their own subheading in the guide. The first location re-emphasises that we need to provide emergency lighting outside emergency exits and then sufficient lighting to get people to safety. It does include the additional important point that the illumination level should be the same as escape routes. It then goes on to identify that it's required in lifts because even though they're not generally used in emergencies, except occasionally when they form part of an escape plan for disabled people, people may be trapped in them if the power fails and emergency lighting will help them to stay calm. Then there's escalators and moving walkways similar to the ones you get in airports, toilets with gross floor areas over eight meters squared, Pretty sure there's a joke in there about gross toilet floors. Then the guide makes the point that battery powered emergency lighting should be provided in all motor generator rooms, control rooms, plant rooms, switch rooms and adjacent to main control equipment associated with the provision of normal and emergency lighting to the premises. Interesting that it makes the point there that these should be battery powered as opposed to being supplied by a backup generator. You can imagine the problem if a generator failed that was providing emergency power to the lights in the room that the generator was in. Bit of a catch-22 there. Then there's a final unillustrated location which is covered car parks. It points out that pedestrian escape routes from covered and multi-storey car parks should be provided with emergency lighting. So, speaking of escape routes, that brings us back to the design procedure. Now, you'd think that escape route lighting would be of incredibly high importance as it allows people to safely leave a building in the event of emergency. And you'd be right, it is really important to get it right. So, why do we only start to add it to our design after all these other points that we've just discussed? Well, it's because once we've got those other items placed, it may well be that we've already achieved the lighting levels for the escape routes that we need. If we haven't quite hit it, then of course we'd need to add some emergency fittings in to bring it up to the right level. Then, following the same principle, we add in the open area emergency lighting, the high risk task area lighting, and position any safety signs. So, we're back round to signage again, showing just how important this subject is. Subheading 4.9 gives us a number of requirements for safety signs, including colour, luminance, ratios of colours and ratios of luminance. Now some of these are a little outside the skill set of the typical electrician or even electrical designer after all how many of us are familiar with RAL codes and colour theory. However we do also find in there the reassurance that if we install emergency light fittings that comply with BSEN 60598-2-22 like these ones from Robus then we should meet those requirements. One thing that we can think about and make sure of is the viewing height of the emergency exit signage. Now this isn't about how high an emergency exit sign is mounted off the ground, but rather it's the height of the image on the fitting compared to how far away the viewer is. There's a couple of rules outlined in the guide relating to two methods of illuminating signs. 
The first is for internally illuminated signs, and the rule is that the viewing distance is 200 times the height of the pictogram, or luminaire at fascia height. So, let's just clarify what this means. By internally illuminated signs, that doesn't mean signs inside the building, it means signs combined with a light fitting into a single unit. When it talks about the height of the pictogram, that's very specifically referring to the sign on the fitting, not the size of the fitting itself. So on this robust fitting, the sign is 100 millimeters high. Multiplying that by 200 gives us 20,000 millimeters or 20 meters. So this is the maximum distance away that the sign can be seen and legibly understood as giving a direction to safety. Of course, if the fitting is installed at the end of a long corridor, then it may be necessary to either install a fitting with a higher pictogram or to install another sign further along the corridor. If the sign isn't combined with the luminaire, but rather lit from an external emergency fitting, then the distance is reduced as shown in indent B here. Externally illuminated signs, 100 times the height of the pictogram. So if the pictogram on the sign was 100 millimeters high, then the viewing distance would be 100 multiplied by 100, giving a viewing distance of 10,000 millimeters or 10 meters. So a smaller viewing distance, but entirely acceptable within that limitation. Another factor that would affect the viewing distance is the viewing angle. If an emergency exit sign was mounted at the end of a corridor, then you're pretty much always facing it front on. This is referred to as the normal viewing angle to the sign. If, however, you look at the sign from a different angle, it will start to affect how legible it is. To take it to an extreme, if you're viewing the sign at 90 degrees from the normal angle, then you can't read it at all. For this reason, if the fitting is going to be installed in a position where it will be viewed from an angle away from the normal, then you multiply the viewing distance by the cosine of that angle. So if the fitting is in a sports hall and could be viewed at 45 degrees from the normal, or front-on view, then our fitting we used as an example earlier would have the 20 meters viewing distance multiplied by the cosine of 45 degrees, which is around 0.707. And so the viewing distance at that angle becomes just over 14 meters. Of course, the great thing about manufacturers like Robus is they have phenomenal technical and design departments who can help you with information and designs so that you can be confident that you're getting it all right. One of the questions we get all the time about emergency escape signs is the direction that the arrow should point in when they're indicating straight on, either along a corridor or more often over an exit door. The guide has this to say on the subject. There is no specific guidance as to how direction arrows for straight on should point, but HSE document L64, Safety Signs and Signals, Industry Committee on Emergency Lighting, ICEL, Publications, and BS5499-4 all give guidance. If you look into the ICEL guidance as stated there, it recommends that the arrow for straight on should point upwards rather than downwards, but with a little caveat that in the event you pass through a door and then need to descend a staircase or ramp to exit along the escape route, then the arrow should point downwards in that case. As the guide concludes its thoughts on this issue by saying, eventually it must be a common sense choice on the installation, taking into account the layout and the possibility of any misunderstandings and a consistent approach should be taken through an installation. So that's a good reminder to stay consistent throughout an installation with your signage to reduce confusion and panic in an emergency. So there we go, that's how to install compliant emergency lighting signage, but you may be wondering how to provide emergency light to one of those high risk areas we mentioned. Well, to find out more about that, check out this video right here, or click the link in the description below to watch it as part of our free training package to help you with your CPD and you'll receive a certificate as well. For further information on emergency lighting from Robust, check out their latest catalogue or get in touch with them via email on info at All that remains in this video is to say, thank you very much for watching.